Hi, everybody. It's another Conversations with, and I'm Dick Vaughn, and with me today, and I look forward to this program every single month. Bonnie, Bonnie Wallace is with me today. Bonnie, it's great to see you, and uh, it's always fun to have you here because we, we just chat about exciting things and about what, you know, one of the things that I, I, I just respect and admire you so much for is that you have such a great attitude, and, and, and I say that uh, because it, it, sometimes you talk to people, and, and I told someone this morning, I got two great gifts this morning. And they said, what was that? I said, my eyes opened. And they looked at me like I was crazy. But people think about that. Just think for a minute about waking up this morning, how fortunate you are just to wake up. Okay? And, and so many people take so much for granted. And they just take that, well, what did you expect? And then I pick up the Worcester Telegram and I look and I show them that 18 poor souls didn't make it this morning. You know, and then you see the sad ones, 34 years old after a long illness or unfortunately, you know, drugs today with the drugs epidemic, these young people doing themselves in, you know, and, and, and yet it's so important to take two seconds to just be grateful. I am right with you. I, thank you so much, and I'm humbled for your compliment. And this morning, when I woke up, the first thing that came to my mind is thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you. I'm alive. Yeah, yeah. I'm so grateful for this day. Yeah, yeah. I'm just so grateful to be here. I mean, people, I mean, we are, do you, I mean, I think people really don't know how lucky they are to be alive. They don't. We are so lucky to be alive right now. We on have my, such on, an opportunity well, right it, now in this, in this time. And to make, a, to make a difference. To make a difference. Just to make a difference. We have the best opportunity possible well, right you know, now. One of the things we were talking about with some friends the other day was that someone asked me about what was it like when I grew up. Well, I grew up, I graduated from high school in 1953. In fact, I... The other day, I got to tell you, the other day I get a call. I'm driving, we're going to Rebezzi's. And, I, and someone calls my phone, and Jen answered it. She says, oh, he's right here. He, hold on a second. Puts on, he says, Dick Vaughn. I said, yep. He said, Fred Bent. And he, I said, Fred, how are you? Fred and I went to school together. Now, now, I haven't seen Fred Bent for five years. This is our 65th class anniversary. Wow. So he said to me, what are you doing October 13th? So I told him, I said, I... It's a long way off, pal. I got to get through tonight, <laughs> you know. And he laughed, and he said, "Well, we're going to have a get together." I said, "I said, yeah, but we're the survivors. We're all in our 80s. We're going to be 82 or 83 or 80. Some of them are 84." And he says, "Yep, you're right." And he says, "There's not many of us left, but there's enough of us. We're going to have a get together in October." I said, "Great." He says, "I have one favor." I said, "What's that?" He says, "Will you wear your M sweater?" Will you what? Wear your M sweater. I your, have my football sweater. Oh, your We your used to football, get sweaters. Your, your I, letter. I, yeah, my senior year. Your letter jacket. Well, we had navy letterman's jacket. We had navy blue yeah. crew neck sweaters. And you got those for your sophomore year and, and, your, and your junior year. And your junior year had one stripe. Only for varsity sports, right? Varsity. Right, right. So your, so senior, year, you could, your senior year, you could pick white or, or navy blue. Well, I have a white one. Okay. And I have, I have three gold stripes on my sweater. Oh. And, and I'm one of the last people ever to get three stripes. And, uh, and so I have that. And he asked me to wear it. I said, sure, I'll be glad to wear it. And I chuckled. And he said, nope. He said, he says, it's, it's just so great, you know, that we're going to be. So we're going to get together. Anyway, someone asked me about what it was like growing up. I said, in the 50s, let me tell you what it was like. I said, it was a different world. I said, if you did something in the neighborhood, by the time you got home, your father already knew. And they asked me about, what's the difference? I said, society has done it to itself. I said, and here's what's happened. Each generation that grew up said, I'm not going to treat my kids the way my mother and father treated me. Well, I didn't say that. I treated my kids exactly the same way because I had the greatest mother in the world. And my mother taught us two things to be independent and stand up on your own two feet and be responsible and credible. And to the day she died, when she lived at the Cape before she died, we're still in the refrigerator. This is what the sign said. We are ultimately responsible for ourselves. 
And that's, so good. And that's how we were brought up. Well, I brought my kids up the same way. Now, at Christmas, when they get together now, remember when he did this to us? Remember when he, and of course, it's, everybody laughs. It's, the, the, I got five of them. And so I was, they said, well, what's happened? I said, because each generation got away from the values that were brought here by all those people who came from another country and another culture. Originally, nobody was from America. Right. So as each group came, they brought a lot of their own cultures with them, and they were brought up by those same, and they, those people came here for a better world, to do something new in this, in the, we used to be called the new world. We still are, and, and by some well, people. We are. <laughs> and, and, the th and the thing is, Bonnie, that, that, and I said, let me tell you what's really happened. I can describe our, our society in America today with two words. The first word is rationalization. We can rationalize everything we do, including murder. And you've seen it happen, where they'll rationalize why they did it. And the second word is entitled. There are those people in these new generations who think they're entitled. Entitled? I had to work for a living. I worked since I was 15 years old, okay? I had little jobs here and there. I never was unhappy. I was never frustrated. I started in radio when I was 17. Five dollars a week I used to get for work on Saturdays at the ra local radio station. And that's how I got into broadcasting. Ended up owning and operating stations. But that was my effort. That's something I did. And so I think what's really happened is that we've lost a lot of those things the way we were brought up. We've let some of those slip. And as each generation comes along, I mean, I have a friend, and she's a delightful person, and she has a boy and a girl. They're 15 and 13. Guess who runs the house? The two kids. She spends all her time rushing all over the place, has no time for herself. I gotta go here. She's gotta go to dancing school. He's gotta, he's on me. He's on the track team. I gotta be there. I gotta do this. Stop. Take charge. I said, at least do this. There's three of you. Single mom, I said, the daughter gets a third, your son gets a third, and there's a third for mommy. And when mommy has her third, leave me alone. I think that's a great advice for any parent, actually. I think a lot of parents don't take that advice. But I do want to circle back to something you just said, which is about the two things that you teach, teach your kids. Um, and one of them is to be responsible for themselves. Right. And, and that is something that I really focus on with my own kids yeah. because I have four kids. Yeah. So you know when you were a kid yeah. that it's really easy to kind of cop out of something when you go, oh, well, my sibling did it too or, yeah. you know, so-and-so did it. Well, I was an only child. I had no one no. else to blame it on. No. I had no one else to fall back on. No. It was just me. Yeah. So if, some, if someone did something, it was me. And yeah. I had no choice, but I couldn't lie about it. I had to take responsibility for it. So when my kids try to tell me, oh, well, he did it too, or he started it, or whatnot, you know, that, yeah. this happens. All kids do that. Oh. All kids do that. I say to them, it doesn't matter what anyone else did at the end of the day only person who is responsible for your actions is you. Yep. Someone in your class could do something, six other people do the same thing. If you join in, guess who's responsible for that? Yeah, you made Not the decision. Not those six other people, you, you. you. So if you come home from school and tell me 10 people got in trouble and you're one of them, guess who's responsible for getting in trouble? Only you. Only you. Because yeah. you knew the rule. Yeah. You knew it. You knew it. I've told you this about yeah. my dear friend, Morris Borenstein, the psychiatrist that I studied with. And I told you about the science on my refrigerator. You can, and this is Morris used to say this. You can do anything you want to do, any time that you want to do it, as long as you're responsible for your actions and are willing to pay the price for your actions not knowing in advance, however, what the price 
might be. And you'd say, you want to go rob a bank? Go ahead. But if you get caught and you go to jail, then you can't whine <laughs> about going to jail because that's the price for getting caught robbing the bank. Now, if you get away with it, good for you. But remember, if you get caught, what the price is? You can do anything you want to do any time that you want to do it, as long as you're willing to pay the price for your actions, not knowing in advance, however, what that price might be. You get kicked out of school. When I went to school at Malden High School, if you got kicked out of school, you'd go to Mr. Matthews and he'd send you home. However, in those days, dads worked, moms stayed at home, basically. In order to get back into Malden High School, you had to bring your mother and your father. And he just wanted to make sure daddy knew. And how pleased do you think your father was if he had to miss work, be late for work to get you back into school? You know, and very few kids got kicked out of school. Now, we had to wear shirts and ties. If you forgot a tie, the girls in the commercial department that took sewing made our colors were navy blue and gold. And we had great big navy blue bow ties that were this big. I kid you not. <laughs> navy blue with gold polka dots on them. And you got one of those for the day. Uh. How many times do you think you'd forget your tie? Right. And <laughs> now, of course, so th it's a new era. Because, yeah. you know, it, it, it's about sort of seeing things through a different lens. Yeah. Because while I see and respect that there's a natural consequence for each accent, yeah. and that's how I try to, you know, raise my children and yeah. help them to learn, yeah. you know, there's an act a natural consequence for yeah. your action. You know, if you do this, this is going to happen. And yep, that's the price you I'm pay. And I'm not going to cry about it. If you want to cry, that's up to you. But it was your decision, not mine. So now you yeah. have to learn from the decision. Now, at the same time, I think our culture is becoming more aware that there are certain kids who don't have two parents. You know, that well, there are certain kids who... Families are gone. A lot of right. And so well, we have to have... 54% of the marriages in the United States of America end up in a divorce. Right. And See, you know who takes the pounding? The tragedy of divorce. Guess who takes the hit? The kids. Because they're like ping pong balls. They got three days with dad. This weekend's with mom. So you have to understand yeah. in this day and age, these kids could forget their tie here yeah, or there or whatever yeah, yeah. and then show up. And so yeah. then... There's a fine line, and I, I respect the word rationalization because I do think a lot of people rationalize things. Oh. And at the same time, I think that we're trying to shift into a more compassionate culture. Yep. To be more understanding and compassionate to someone who maybe is getting shifted back and forth to somebody yep. who maybe is. And so it, it's really about understanding how can we come from a, a place of compassion and have compassion for someone who might have gotten yeah. caught up and forgot their tie for one yeah. reason or another or who, for right. a child who made a bad decision. And then, you know, in, in this new culture that we're in now, it's like you wouldn't want to stigmatize a child socially by making them wear this giant bow tie. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because okay. then... You couldn't do that today. They'd arrest you. Yeah. Right. But at the same time, you have to understand the reason why you can't do that is because then the kid's going to get bullied and then they're going to go home and then they're going to wind up right. d depressed. And so, so it's a very different culture. So how can we be compassionate towards people who might have made a choice that wasn't great or might be in a situation that's right. not as fortunate as our situation. How can we be compassionate and yet also hold people accountable, accountable for their it's, actions? So we have to really... It's, there's a balance you have to it's, put together. It's a, and it's a very delicate balance. Well, you know, when I was a kid growing up, and I, I grew up in Malden, and we had a curfew in the 50s. And at 9 o'clock at night, the fire whistles blew three times. Well, we all, all the jocks, we all hung around the square, Malden Square. That's where everybody went. And there was a police officer named Tommy Heath, young mama Malden, high star of the foot, you know, now a police officer. And Tommy would start, he knew, every, he knew every kid by name, everybody by name. And he would start walking around the square at about quarter of nine. And he'd look and say, Vaughn, 
You live up in Oak Grove, it's going to take you 12 minutes to get home. You better get going. Because if you don't, I'll bring you home in the car. And if I bring you home in the car and I bring you to the door, boy, what is your father going to say? And so you left. Now, if a cop did that today, they'd have him up on charges or something. But that's, that's how we grew up, with discipline. There was discipline. And, and if you didn't do what you were told, they'd take you home in the car. He'd put you in the cruiser and drive you home. And he'd walk up and say, hi, Mr. Bond, here he is. <laughs> you know, and that's all your father would need. What were you doing, you know? Well, it's a different world today because now police officers can't do that. They'll, they'd be all over him, you know, if he, if he said something like that to a kid. But, but it was discipline, and that was, that was what we learned. We were disciplined. If you had to be home at 9, you got home at 9. And you didn't even argue about it, didn't even think about it. You just did it. Well, you know, but then every Sunday, I mean, I, I've told the story a hundred times. Every Sunday, my mother was one of 13 kids. I'm the oldest of 29 grandchildren. Well, every Sunday, we all, would, we all had to be at Nana McGee's at 1 o'clock for dinner. And Nana had, would have put on dinner, and she'd be at the top of the stairs waiting. And, of course, Nana came from Ireland, and Nana had a broke. And I was the old, I was 11 or 12 at the time. And eventually that broke up because we all had our own places and the families got bigger and bigger and poor Nana couldn't do it anymore. But anyway, she'd be waiting at the top of the stairs. And I'd come charging up the stairs first because I was the oldest. And she'd say, Dickie, Dickie, get over here and talk to your Nana. And I'd come over and she'd be right in my face and she'd say, Dickie, tell Nana what color the priest was wearing this morning. And you better know the answer. <laughs> now, if you got that right, she'd say, that's wonderful. Now, tell Nana a little bit about the gospel. She, she wanted to make sure you went to church, and then she wanted to make sure you paid attention. <laughs> but that's, but those, that's gone, you know. But that's the way we were brought up, you know. And, and uh, I've got to tell you a great story about kids. I had just finished the cellar we bought up, built a house somewhere. My father was a cape. My dad had drawn the plans. We had it built. We moved in. And I had the four little kids. The little kids. They were like 12 down to two or three. And I had finished the cellar. And I came home one night and I went down cellar for something. And at the bottom of the cellar stairs on my newly painted wall was a peace sign painted. There it was. Round. The little legs. And there was the peace sign. Well, I took one look at it, and I know who did it. And so I went back upstairs, and I called a meeting of the four of them. And we used to have a, we used to have a jury. That if whoever was guilty, the others would vote what the punishment would be. <laughs> so we, and I said how many hits they would get or whatever it was. So I said, of course, we had, I had three boys and a girl at the time. The other girl came later. And uh, so the two older boys, and then Kathy, and then Mike. So I said, you guys, somebody painted the sign for me. Who did it? Of course, nobody did it. I said, well, you better have a meeting and come back and tell me who did it. You have four minutes for the meeting. So they go in the other room, and they came back. Kathy did it. Of course, they, of course they talked Kathy into taking it because he likes you. You're his only girl, and he won't do anything to you. <laughs> so I, of course, still knew who did it. So we went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And finally, I said, look, since you're not going to tell me, I'm going to tell you who did it. And they all looked at me. I said, Jonathan did it. Jonathan was the second one. About four years, they, they, had, they could never figure out how I knew that Jonathan did it. Well, first of all, it was really easy. And so about four years ago at Christmas, they found, Dad, how did you know? And of course, I would never tell them. I'd just say, think about it. And they never could. I says, let me tell you how I knew. Was done with a spray can, spray paint. Went into my little workshop and got the spray paint. And I said, let me tell you how I knew. I says, because when somebody would spray paint a peace sign, they would paint it, spray it right in front of them. They wouldn't go like this. Well, they wouldn't go down here. They would stand there and go right in front of them and make it. So I knew how tall Jonathan was, so I knew <laughs> who did it. Because Dennis, it would have been up here. And if it was Kathy, it would have been down here. 
And if it was Michael, he couldn't even push the button. He's so little. <laughs> well, they, of course, they said, oh. It took him 25 <laughs> or 30 years to figure out how I knew who did it. But, but that's kids, you know. So what color was the peace sign? Oh, it was, I think they, it was gold. Gold? It, they painted with gold spray paint. What color was the wall behind it? Oh, the wall was like a pale blue. So in hindsight, do you think this was his like own personal political revolution? Like Well, those t if, back in those <laughs> days, you, you, you may be too young, but this was back in the, let's see, Dennis was born in 60, Jonathan was born in 60. This was probably 60, Seven or sixty-eight. Right. So do you think Everything. this was like his own? Well, well, because every year I, I used to, <laughs> our, 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 well, our, our Christmas wreath on the front door. I had a friend who owned a florist shop, and he used to make me out of a real live wreath a peace sign. It was made of all wreaths, and I had a white spotlight that shined on shined on it. So that was the in thing was this peace sign. Right. So I, I, I never, I never asked why he did it. Uh, he just did it. Because I, I, I don't know whether he wanted to, he thought I'd like it because I had the peace sign. Right. Of, he might have, it might have been like him trying to um, sort of support you in your mission for peace. I yeah. mean, it could have been his own little personal. Right. How but old was he? Like. He was probably nine. Yeah. So nine, in his eight, mind, he nine, could have been like, I'm joining this peace movement. Yeah. My father will like this. I'm going to yeah. show my dad yeah. that I'm supporting this so movement. So I, well, for peace. his punishment, his punishment <laughs> was he had to come downstairs and he had to paint over it with the blue paint. That was his punishment. Which is exactly what I was talking about. It's like the punishment has to fit. It's like that course, natural yeah. consequence. And being compassionate to the kid, like, oh, this is beautiful. I love yeah. that you're supporting my peace movement. Yeah. But mommy doesn't want, or daddy doesn't yeah, want the peace sign here. Yeah. We have other places. Yeah. Maybe you could paint a, paint it on a picture, and maybe yeah. we could hang the picture. Well, I didn't go that far. I just said paint but the wall. But what I'm saying is, is in, in this new generation of raising kids, as oh, a yeah. mom now, oh, yeah. I think there's a happy medium between letting it go and saying nothing. Oh, oh, that. Do you know what I mean? That never happened with Dickie. I know, but what I'm saying is, because I think there's some parents who, yeah. would, be, who would rationalize the kid, like what I just did, I rationalized. Well, he's an eight-year-old boy. Yeah. He saw me put a peace sign up. Yeah. He likes peace. He thinks that's a nifty idea. There's probably a lot of songs on the yeah. radio right now. Oh, everything was, that's all, that's I, everything all was, John Lennon was everywhere. All right. yeah. And he's probably like, I want to be part of this yeah. peace movement. Yeah. You know, maybe that's my life's mission. I should just put it here on the wall in the basement yeah. where it's not too obvious. Yeah, And, and so a, a, a parent could rationalize that and then just leave it there and let it go. But what I'm saying is there's a, there's a, there's a place in the middle where you can you know, compassionately well, say, I, I, I see But there's a lesson you. to be learned. Right, but then you still have to paint this over because this isn't how mommy wants her wall or daddy yep. wants his wall. You still got to paint it over and I'm going to let you have your own place to express yourself yeah. on this piece of yeah. paper or the, whatever, you know what I mean? But, yeah. but I think this is for my generation and for, you know, millennials who are raising kids, I think it's really important that we take these lessons that, you know, it's not about like corporal punishment, oh, no. but it's about a natural consequence Quince for what you did for not yeah. being respectful of your property as right. being the owner of the home. Like right. this is my home. I painted it the color I wanted. Yeah. You're living here because you're my child. Yeah. Therefore, you will leave the wall the color that <laughs> I want it because yeah. it's my house. Yeah. And when you can afford your own house, you can paint go peace signs all paint, over it. Exactly, <laughs> peace signs up and down, yeah, left and right, yeah, every yeah. rainbow color you yeah, want. But that's yeah. it's not your house yet. That's right. And when it is, then you can do it your way. And that's what you're talking about the entitlement. Yeah. So. What came to my mind about entitlement is that I do think that there is a culture that's sort of easing in, and I think it's sort of like this backlash to this um, very, you know, strict, strict, um, you know, my way or the highway yeah. way of parenting. But what you've mentioned so beautifully is that your mother and your grandmother oh, yeah. were incredibly loving and compassionate. Oh yeah. And I think that, and and they they loved themselves enough to be proud of who they, they were. were. Yeah. And enough to be proud. And I think that, for some reason, 
that sort of missed a beat and missed a generation that yeah. there there wasn't this pride for who you are for you know, That's this, right. and so I think again it's a fine line between what I would say is each of our birthright. Yeah. Not necessarily entitlement, but that it's our birthright to be loved, to be seen. And, and, and I think one of the tragedies of, of where we've lost families, where the family, I mean, 54% of the families aren't a family anymore right. and in this country. And what's happened then is that that, that, that that nurturing and that togetherness is gone. And the kids, however old they are growing up, see a mom and dad who once were there, that was their mom and dad, like this. And then, unfortunately, some of those are not pleasant and they're nasty divorces and things are said that shouldn't be said in front of the kids or to the kids, and now the kids are forced to try to pick a side and they can't do it, it's not fair. And so what happens is the kids um, get bitter, and, and then they, and they lose that, that sense of, like in your case, there's you and your husband and the four kids just went on a great vacation to Florida and spent time together. And, 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 I, and I have friends who are, are, are divorced, and, and I had one, this one friend spends, she said, I, I have no time for me. And she has two kids. And this one's got to go to dancing, and I got to go here, and I got to. Blah, blah, blah. I said, "Whoa, take time for yourself." That, and you got to sit with the kids. They're they're 15 and 13. They can think, they can reason. That you need, you have your own time, you know, just like you give them their time. And, um, but like she said, easier said than done. Well, it is, but I do think that's part of what's missing in our generation because your mother's generation, your grandmother's generation, they didn't think twice to take care of themselves. Oh, that's right. They didn't think twice to take pride in themselves and to take care of themselves. And yes, they were there as a steward to their family. Yeah. But they were also very aware of their own selves and, that's right. and, and taking care of their own needs. And and in a sense, putting their own right. life mask on first and saying to a child, I'm sorry, but you have to wait because mommy is taking care of this first. Oh, yeah. And, and they had no problem saying that. Right. And I think that we've sort of lost track yeah. of the idea that we can put ourselves first and say, you know, I need to take care of me today. Yeah. And I will also take care of you, but I need to put my life yeah. mask on my yeah. oxygen mask on well, first. you know you say that I remember my mother teaching me how to make a bed my own because all of a sudden there was four of us and and she said to me hey she said I'm gonna teach you how to make your bed because I complained one day I came home and it wasn't made and she said I didn't have time to make it today I had to do this and this and this I had a quick supper I had and I was appalled and she said well after supper I'm gonna teach you how to do the bed and then you can do it every day. And when you get home at night, it'll be nice and ready for you. Exactly. And that's what she did. I know we gotta, we gotta do a song because we had another great program. Yeah, so this is the perfect song to wrap it up on. When I was just a little girl, I asked my mother, what will I be? Will I be pretty? Will I be rich? Here's what she said to me. Que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. The future's not ours to see. Que sera, sera. Now I have children of my own. They asked their mother, what will I be? Will I be handsome? Will I be rich? I tell them tenderly. Que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. The future's not ours to see. What will be, will be. Que sera, sera. 
you have it, folks. That's another Conversations With.